This morning, I want to begin our study by calling your attention to a most remarkable statement. I read it just a few minutes ago, made by the Apostle Peter. First Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Peter says that in this you greatly rejoice, even though now, for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. Now, what I want you to notice is the way that Peter describes these people, these Christians that he's writing to. He describes them as both rejoicing as well as being distressed at the same time. Now, think about this. Peter says that these people were rejoicing, great joy in their hearts, their lives, while at the same time, they're distressed, which means that they were sorrowful, they were, they were grieving. How is that possible? How can someone be both rejoicing and sorrowing simultaneously? Well, it is possible because Scripture says it. Right here it says it. Peter tells us how it's possible. The verses leading up to the statement, which I read to you just before we prayed together, Peter tells them about this glorious salvation that they have, this gift of God, this being born again that God has has done in our lives. He's given us a living hope. He's given us an inheritance that is awaiting us in heaven, and we know we're going to experience this because we are being protected by the power of God right now. And when we die, we will come into the fullness of, of our inheritance, the fullness of our salvation. Now, in this, Peter says, in this salvation, you rejoice. That's what you're rejoicing in. But at the same time they're rejoicing, he says, they're also distressed, or as the King James Version puts it, in heaviness. And the reason their hearts are heavy is because he says they are presently going through many trials. King James says manifold trials As Peter goes on to explain in his letter, these trials have come to them because they are suffering because of their faith in Christ. Now, as we said a moment ago, this state or this condition of these Christians may seem like a complete impossibility, even a contradiction to be both rejoicing and distressed at the same time, but it is not an impossibility, and it is not a contradiction. In fact, it's one of the most glorious and and important truths of the Christian life, that we are a people who can rejoice because of all that Jesus Christ has done for us, while at the same time carry around a heaviness of heart due to the many trials that we're experiencing. In his book, Spiritual Depression, Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones explains this paradox of rejoicing and sorrowing at the same time, and how important it is that we understand that it does exist and that it is quite normal for us. He writes this. This is something about which we must be very clear. There is a superficial view of Christianity which would regard this as quite impossible, the kind of view of the Christian life which simply says that all the problems have gone and now I'm happy all the day. Such people cannot accept Peter's description for a moment and wouldn't say of any Christian who is in heaviness that it is doubtful whether he's a Christian at all. There is that teaching concerning the Christian life which gives the impression that once one has arrived at a decision or once one has been converted, there are no more troubles, no ripples on the sea of life. Everything is perfect and there are no problems whatsoever. Now, the simple answer to that view is that that is not New Testament Christianity. That's, a kind, that's the kind of thing which the cults have always offered and which modern psychology is also offering. There is nothing for which one should thank God so much, he writes, as the honesty of the scriptures. They give us the simple truth about ourselves and about our life in this world. Now, no one was more familiar with this paradoxical reality of rejoicing while at the same time being distressed and troubled in heart than David the king of Israel. As one reads the many psalms that David penned, we constantly find him going back and forth between praising God, rejoicing in God, being glad in all that the Lord has done for him, while concurrently he's crying out to God. He's distressed. He's experiencing deep sorrow, deep anguish, as he undergoes intense affliction at the hands of his enemies. There is no psalm that illustrates this paradox better than the one that we began to study last Sunday, Psalm 31. So I invite you to turn there, and I want to read to you 
at least part of this psalm up to verse 18. David writes, in you, O Lord, I have taken refuge. Let me never be ashamed. In your righteousness, deliver me. Incline your ear to me. Rescue me quickly. Be to me a rock of strength, a stronghold to save me. For you are my rock and my fortress. For your name's sake, you will lead me and guide me. For you will, or you will pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. For you are my strength. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You have known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over into the hands of the enemy. You have set my feet in a large place. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I'm in distress. My eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my body has wasted away because of all my adversaries. I've become a reproach, especially to my neighbors, as an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I'm forgotten as a dead man, out of mind. I'm, I'm like a broken vessel, for I have heard the slander of many terrors on every side. While they took counsel together against me, they schemed to take away my life. But as for me, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies and from those who persecute me. Make your face to shine upon your servants. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent in Sheol. Let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. Now, the psalm goes on, but that's enough for now. But as we discovered last week from our study of this psalm, David was in deep trouble, deep trouble. He tells us that he's in such distress that it has actually brought the man to tears. He's been crying over this. This, this trial also has robbed him of his physical strength, his, his vitality, his energy. His, his pain, he tells us, was brought on by being slandered by his enemies. They told lies about him. And what was so painful to David that on top of this, his friends actually believed these lies. And they rejected him by ignoring him. They treated him as if he was a dead man. He didn't exist to them anymore. Forgotten, gone. In addition to the lies they were saying about him and the rejection that he felt from his friends, he tells us in verse 13 that his adversaries were actually scheming to take away his life. In other words, there was a plot going on to murder him, a conspiracy underway to kill him. And yet at the same time, while all this was going on, David, as he's undergoing this terrible time of suffering, which he describes, by the way, in verse 10, as his life being spent with sorrow, his years with sighing. He also tells us that he's rejoicing. He's happy in the Lord. Verse 7, I'll rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness. He also tells us that this was a time that he was praising God, specifically for God's goodness and God's loving kindness, in spite of how difficult things were for him. Notice, he says, we didn't read this, but verse 19 says, how great is your goodness which you have stored up for those who fear you, which you have wrought for those who take refuge in you before the sons of men. And in verse 21, blessed be the Lord, for he has made marvelous his loving kindness to me in a besieged city. Now, it is in the midst of both rejoicing in God's goodness and love, while at the same time experiencing this great sense of heaviness in his soul, that David tells us that the key issue for him in surviving such a, a difficult time was that he trusted the Lord. Through this all, he trusted the Lord. Over and over again in this psalm, David states that his trust, his faith, his belief, his confidence was in the Lord to rescue him from those who were intent on harming him. This is probably the time when Absalom rose up, his own son, to try to take the throne away from David and orchestrate his, his own father's death. And <clears throat> more than simply telling us, though, that his trust was in God, David, note this, tells us why he was trusting God. He gives us reasons. He, he gives us tangible, concrete reasons as to why he didn't lose hope, why he was so certain that God was going to intervene and deliver him and act on his behalf, even though his situation at the time looked so 
bleak. And that really becomes the heart of this psalm. You see, David's purpose for telling us about his trust is to teach us as the people of God to trust in the Lord when, when we're in trouble, when we feel like everything in our lives just falling apart. And we know that David wrote this with us in mind and all believers who would read this because he tells us so in the last two verses of the psalm, verses 23 and 24, he writes, O oh, love the Lord, all you his godly ones, his people. The Lord preserves the faithful, fully recompenses the proud doer. Be strong, let your heart take courage, all you who hope in the Lord. So these verses tell us that David's purpose in writing this is not to simply pour out his own heart as a as sort of therapy for himself, but he's opening his heart to us concerning how he handled his crisis in life so that by the power of the Spirit of God, we would be moved to love the Lord, to trust the Lord more and more. David wants to encourage us. He wants to strengthen our hearts. He, he, he wants us to have hope as we go through our trials in what appears to be sometimes very hopeless situations. So it was written with us in mind. And the way that David teaches us to trust the Lord in times of trouble is, as I said, he tells us why he trusted God, why in his life he was so confident, even though he had these terrible things going on around him. Now, as we mentioned last Sunday, that the, the common thread that seems to run through these verses and the thread that connects the, the various truths in this psalm is that David reveals several reasons, there are actually four of them, as to why he placed his trust in the Lord, why he was so confident that God was going to rescue him when his situation looked so hopeless. See, it's vitally important for us to know the reasons that David could trust the Lord in his time of trouble. Why? Because we're now 3,000 years later, and these folks are the very same reasons that you and I can trust the Lord in our times of trouble. That's how relevant the Word of God is. Now, in this psalm, David, as I said, he brings out four specific reasons for trusting God in times of trouble. Last week, we looked at the first of these reasons. He tells us that God can be trusted because he is faithful to keep his word. Now, I needn't review all that we said last Sunday, except to draw your attention to verse 5, which is a key, key verse. Into your hand, he said, I commit my spirit. You've ransomed me, O Lord, God of truth. In this statement, David not only tells us that he has made a decision to entrust his, his very life, his soul means his life into God's hand, but he tells us why he did this. He says he trusted the Lord as his rock, his fortress, his stronghold, because God is the God of truth. Notice the last phrase of verse 5. He calls the Lord the God of truth. It's really as simple as that. God tells the truth. In other words, he trusts the Lord because he knows that God keeps his word. And his word says that he takes care of his children. So David is trusting him because he believes that God will never lie to him, never mislead him, never deceive him. Listen, the reason that you and I can trust the Lord is because he has given us many, many promises in his word, and he'll keep these promises. We have promises assuring us that he's a loving father who will take care of his children. He's promised to give us grace for every single difficult situation that we find ourselves in. He's promised to provide for our needs He's promised to strengthen us so that we can resist temptation and we can resist Satan. He's told us that he'll never put us in any situation without giving us the strength and the help we need to handle that situation. He's promised that in all the things, all the events, all the circumstances of our lives, God is using that for our good. We can trust him to keep these promises to us. Why? Because he is the God of truth. Thy word is truth. As I said, he never lies to us. He's never deceptive. He'll never mislead you. What he says, he means. Now, in a world where people lie much of the time, if not most of the time, it's a great comfort to know that our God has pure and absolute and flawless integrity. 
that his word is perfect and without error, and it can be relied upon because he who is truth always speaks the truth. Listen, much of our success in living the Christian life really depends on what we do with the word of God, how we view it, how seriously we take the word of God. And that means we walk by faith in his word, even when we can't feel something, or even when we we don't understand what God is doing, you don't see what God is doing. This is really the whole message of Hebrews chapter 11. These great men and women who lived during Old Testament times, they walked by faith. They didn't understand what was going on. They didn't see what was happening, but God had given them promises, and they walked by faith. We're called to do the same, the same thing. The kind of faith, as the writer to the Hebrews describes it, is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. I love what Spurgeon said. I've said it many times. It never fails to grip my, my heart. It is so true, so well put. Spurgeon said this, when we cannot see the hand of God, we can trust the heart of God. His word tells you that his heart is good, and loving and wise towards you regardless of your circumstances. So what do we need to do? Do what David did. Believe his word because he is the God of truth. So the first reason David gives us for why we can trust God in times of trouble is because God is faithful to keep his word. And David said, I believe him because he's truth. But as David continues writing the psalm. He moves on to give us a second reason why we can trust God in times of trouble. And the second reason is because God has delivered us in the past. A very important truth. God has delivered us in the past. Notice verse 6. I hate those who regard vain idols, but I trust in the Lord. Now, having just spoken of the Lord as the God of truth, David now makes a contrast between his God, who always speaks truth, and the gods of of the pagans, which he refers to as vain idols, and the implication is that they do not speak truth. They lie. In fact, their very existence is a lie, and they deceive their followers. They lie to their followers. They lead them into gross wickedness. David says that he hates those who regard these empty, worthless idols, meaning that he completely rejects them. He rejects those who reject the one true God, and he refuses to embrace their lifestyle and their ideology. In other words, he has nothing to do with pagans and their false deities. And the reason that David rejects them is because these false gods lie. They lie to their followers. They are deities of falsehood, and they deceive their worshipers by leading them into erroneous thinking and gross behavior. Now, you may wonder, If these gods are false, then how can they lie? If they're not real, how can they lie? And how can they they do anything to harm their, their followers? What difference does it make? Well, the answer to that question is that the Scripture teaches behind the gods of pagans, behind all false deities, are demons, fallen angels, Satan's helpers, deceitful spirits who pretend to be deities. Who do you think is behind the 300 million false gods of Hinduism? In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 and 20, the Apostle Paul has been speaking about this issue that was important in the early church. Should Christians eat foods that had been sacrificed to idols? Some said yes, an idol is nothing. Some said No, because we come from these backgrounds, uh, our conscience is not clear to do this. Paul's been teaching about how you work through this issue, which is really a, a liberty issue, depending on a person's conscience. But he says in 1 Corinthians 10, 19 and 20, what do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything, or that an idol is anything? Now watch this. No, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I don't want you to become sharers in demons. He's saying that that you need to understand behind these idols. Yes, an idol is nothing because there's only one true God. But understand this, behind these idols are demons who pretend to be idols. 
The Apostle Paul told Timothy that in the last days, some will fall away from the faith because they will pay attention to deceitful spirits, which, which he defines as those who teach doctrines of demons. In other words, all false theological teaching originates with demons. And the goal of these demons and Satan is teaching error through these teachers. Their goal is to deceive people. That is to say, behind all false teachers are deceitful demons, inspiring them to teach error, whether or not the man or woman who's a false teacher even believes in Satan. That's irrelevant. All theological error comes from the pit of hell. There's a significant statement in Psalm 106, starting in verse 34. The writer is explaining how when the children of Israel came into the land of Canaan, they were told to exterminate the people. The people were horrific people, and God didn't want them on the face of the earth anymore. And he knew that if they continued, they would influence and impact the Jewish people. He wanted them all killed. But they didn't do that. They disobeyed God, and it hurt them. We read this explanation. They did not destroy the peoples as the Lord commanded them, but they mingled with the nations and learned their practices and served their idols, which became a snare to them. So what he's saying is the Jewish people mingled with these pagans, they learned their ways, and they even served their idols. Now, why is that so serious? Said it became a snare to them. Listen to this, verse 37. They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They actually took their own children and sacrificed them, killed them as offerings to these idols, which we now learn were demons. So behind the idols of the Canaanites were demons. Listen, we may not have specific deities in our culture, that we identify as false gods. But remember who the God of this world is. It's Satan, the God of this world. And he rules society by demonic principalities and powers, demons who spread the lies that our culture believes and lives by. Lies about morality lies about ethics, lies about what's right and wrong, lies about what is just and unjust, lies about values. They lie about Christianity. They lie about the Bible. They lie about who Jesus Christ is and the meaning of his death and the message of the gospel. Listen, Satan is a liar. Jesus said that. He's a murderer. He's a liar. He lied to Eve in the Garden of Eden, and he's been lying to her children ever since because his goal is always the same. It's to deceive people, even Christians, and turn them away from the God who is truth. But David wasn't deceived by Satan. He wasn't deceived by his demons. He tells us, as we go back to Psalm 31, that he completely rejects these vain, empty, worthless, demonic idols. And instead, he says... His trust is in the Lord. Why? Because the Lord is true, and he tells the truth, unlike these demons. Now, here's the question. How did David know that the Lord was so trustworthy? How did he know that he could be trusted to always tell the truth and to never lie? Well, one thing that gave David this tremendous assurance and convinced him that God could be trusted was that in the past, God had fulfilled his word to him. God kept his word to David by delivering him from some adversary. And he speaks about God's past deliverance in the next few verses, verses 7 and 8. I will rejoice and be glad in your loving kindness because you have seen my affliction. You've known the troubles of my soul and you have not given me over into the hand of my enemy. You've set my feet in a large place. Now, in these two verses, David tells us that he rejoiced and he was glad in God's love. And he tells us why. He says that it's because God has seen his affliction and has known all about his troubles. And in knowing what David was, was going through, the Lord came to his rescue and he didn't hand him over to his enemy. Instead, the Lord delivered David. He set his, his feet what he means here, large, a wide space, meaning that God put him not in a narrow place, 
where he'd have a balance issue, but in a place that's wide, a place of safety and security. That is to say, he protected David. Now, here's something that we need to understand. What David is telling us about here is not his present situation. Because he, he hadn't been rescued yet. What's a, that's what this psalm is about. He hadn't been rescued yet out of, his, out of his problem. Instead, he's telling us, folks, about how God rescued him in some past situation, out of some terrible situation that in the past he found himself in. And, and here's the point that he's making. His memory of this past deliverance gives him help to trust the Lord to deliver him now from his present situation. See, this is a terribly important principle to understand about why you can trust God no matter how bleak your circumstance appears. The reason you know you can trust him is because he's already proven himself worthy of your trust. He's done it because he's delivered you in the past from some really bad situation, some situation which at the time looked hopeless and you didn't know how you were going to get out of that. But the Lord somehow overcame this seemingly hopeless situation and he did deliver you. Therefore, knowing how good and how faithful God has already been to you, it ought to give you the confidence that he will work like that again in delivering you from some hopeless looking situation in the present or in the future. It's important to remind ourselves just, just how God has worked in our life in the past so that when you face a new crisis, you'll, you'll have confidence that he can work like that again because he's already done it. You've experienced it. For example, most of us can relate to this, perhaps not all, but most. Many of us can think back to a time or perhaps several times in our lives we were very low on money. We had, we had bills coming in. We had, we had needs to meet, responsibilities, but we didn't, we didn't know where the money was going to come from. But we sought the Lord, and he delivered us. He provided for us in ways that we could have never imagined. Never. Now, listen, when you face another financial crisis... You need to think back to what God did for you then because he can do it and will do it again. This is why keeping a, a journal or a diary, it's a good thing because we tend to forget. With a journal, you can look back and remember, oh yeah, I forgot this. This is what the Lord did in my life and it will embolden you to trust him again. Listen, it is so easy to forget all the wonderful things that the Lord has done in the course of our lives. And when we forget, we do fail then to learn the lessons that the Lord has for us. We see this illustrated in the life of some of the, our Lord's apostles, men who initially failed in remembering that Jesus Christ was all-powerful. What he demonstrated in the past concerning his power, that was a lesson for them concerning the present and the future. It's illustrated in John chapter 6. John chapter 6 starts off this way. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd, we learn later, with thousands of people, a large crowd was coming to him. He said to Philip, now Philip's one of his apostles, he said, Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Now, whenever the Lord asks a question, it's not because he needs us to supply the answer. He is omniscient. He knows everything. And John tells us, this he was saying to test him, to test Philip, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Now, notice that the reason we're told that Jesus asked Philip about feeding all these people is because he was testing him. Now, why he chose Philip, we're not told. Maybe Philip was from this area. Maybe Philip wasn't the brightest guy in the group and he was trying to stretch his brain a little bit. I, I, I don't know. But we know he was testing Philip. 
because we're told Jesus knew what he was planning to do. But he wanted to give Philip the opportunity to learn an important lesson, that lesson being that the one who he had seen perform miracle after miracle also had the power to supply the needs of thousands of people who were in front of him. He had the power to provide food for them. But sadly, Philip fails this test because he failed to remember that he had seen Jesus heal the sick, cast out demons, and command the forces of nature to be still. And therefore, he failed to connect the dots. He failed to apply the truth about Christ's power to his present situation. And Andrew wasn't a whole lot better. He wasn't a whole lot better. They, they both didn't see that uh, a lack of supplies. It's no limitation to the Son of God. Didn't they learn anything from the, the miracle of Jesus turning the water into wine that had already taken place? That was the first miracle. Listen, anyone who can turn water into wine can certainly take a small supply of bread and a couple of fish and multiply it for thousands of people to eat. But these men... These men fail to connect the past actions of the Lord to their present conditions. And we're just so often like these men, because in forgetting what Jesus has done for us in the past, we are ill-equipped to handle a crisis in the present. Listen, think back on your life, because the Lord has purposely put you in some very difficult situations and why has he done this? Well, one reason is so that you would learn that you can trust him under any circumstance. Those are lessons for you to learn. Don't fail the test. The next crisis that comes up, remember what he has done for you in the past and trust him to work mightily for you in the present. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now, so far, David has given us two reasons why he trusted God in his time of trouble so he could teach us why we can trust God in our time of trouble we can trust him because God is faithful to keep his word we can trust him because he has delivered us in the past as David continues in Psalm 31 he gives us a third reason why we can trust God in our time of trouble in this and this is the reason because God is sovereign God is sovereign meaning he controls everything nothing happens by accident all things are ordained by him Verses 9 through 13, I'll read it and just comment briefly because we've already gone over this. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I'm in distress. My, my eye is wasted away from grief, my soul and my body also, for my life is spent with sorrow, my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my body is wasted away. Because of all my adversaries, I become a reproach, especially to my neighbors an object of dread to my acquaintances. Those who see me in the street flee from me. I'm forgotten as a dead man out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel, for I've heard the slander of many terrors on every side while they took counsel together against me. They schemed to take away my life. Now, as we've already noted, in these verses, David describes what his crisis, this crisis was doing to him physically, draining his body of energy, causing him to, to cry and to weep. And he tells us exactly what this crisis was, what brought about such sorrow and anguish, his adversaries lying about him, his so-called friends believing these lies, rejecting him, turning away from him. And he says, in addition to all of that, the adversaries were planning to kill him. So David really had it rough, lied about, rejected by those he thought were his friends. That's very painful. In danger of being murdered. No, no wonder... He's crying, and he's lost physical power. However, in spite of how bad his circumstances really were, he makes a very strong statement in the next verse, explicitly stating that his trust was in the Lord. Verse 14, but as for me, as for me, this man going through all of this, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. What a great statement. No matter how difficult David's life was, regardless of how bad things looked, David would not waver in his faith. He tells the Lord, I trust you, O Lord. You are my God. But here's the question we need to ask. 
why was David so unwavering in his faith? Why did he trust the Lord under these circumstances? How can a man do that? Your life is falling apart. Why was David so confident in the Lord when all of these adversaries and his friends were against him? Well, the next verse, David tells us why he could trust the Lord when his circumstances were so bad. It is a great verse. Verse 15, my times are in your hand. Deliver me from the hand of my enemies, from those who persecute me. Folks, this is one of the most significant statements in Scripture. It's brought comfort to countless believers over the centuries, and I'm confident that it will bring great comfort to you if you understand what David meant by these words. See, David tells us that he trusted the Lord to deliver him from his enemies because, he says, his times were in God's hands. Now, what times is David referring to? Listen carefully. He's referring to all of the time periods in his life. The time when he was young, the time when he was middle-aged, and the time when he would grow old. In other words, his entire life and all the events of his life, all the good times, all the bad times, all the times of victory, all the times of defeat, all the times of good decisions, all the times when he made bad decisions, all of these times and events that happened during these times were in God's hands, meaning they were under God's sovereign control. Nothing happened by accident. Everything was under God's ordained decree. See, what David is declaring is that there is no reason for him to panic and waver in his faith, no reason to grow bitter and dis disillusioned and retreat from the Lord, regardless of how bad things might get, because every single event without exception in his life, including this one of being slandered, is under God's sovereign control. As one Bible teacher put it, nothing can come into your life that has not, first of all, passed through the filter of his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Now, let's think about this for a moment. We know that God is sovereign. We know that everything is under his control. At least we should know that because that's what Scripture says. There are many verses that teach the sovereignty of God. Ephesians 1 verse 11 is so special. It says, also, we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to his purpose, who works all things after the counsel of his will. God works all things after the counsel of his will. He doesn't take advice from anybody. Whatever he wants to do, he does. See, nothing happens apart from God ordaining it, decreeing it, deciding that it will happen. Now, let me explain, because this is important. Many people have no problem believing that God is sovereign over nature and over the physical laws of our world. But they hesitate to believe that his sovereignty extends to situations that involve decisions and actions made by people. Decisions and actions that affect us. That is to say, they struggle with the thought that God sovereignly controls the actions and decisions of others so that he moves in the hearts of individuals, even ungodly individuals, to cause them to make choices that bring about his will. That's the real struggle that they have. And the reason they struggle with this is because they think that if God controls the decisions of others, then he must force these individuals to act like robots by violating their free choice and by acting against their own wills. Now, we may not understand how God does this, but the Bible most definitely teaches that God's sovereignty does extend to controlling the decisions made by ungodly individuals. And he does it without forcing anyone to make decisions and choices that would violate their own wills and desires. Consider these biblical statements. Proverbs 21.1 says this, The king's heart is like channels of water in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. That's Proverbs 21.1. Now, in the ancient world, the king was the absolute monarch, the absolute ruler. There were no other governing bodies that he had to listen to. His word was law. 
Yet scripture says that God is the one who controls the heart of the king and he moves his heart to make decisions just as easily as a man directs the flow of water in irrigation canals. Listen, if God controls the heart and the decisions and the choices made by the most powerful people on earth, kings, then he certainly controls the decisions made by anyone and everyone. We see his control over rulers illustrated in the Old Testament. The Bible says in Ezra chapter 1, verse 1, that the Lord, note this, move the heart of Cyrus, move the heart of Cyrus, king of Persia, who made a proclamation that the Jewish people could return home to their land and rebuild their temple. Now listen, Cyrus wasn't a godly man. He was a pagan king. He had no faith in the Lord. None at all. Yet God moved this man's heathen heart to accomplish exactly what God wanted to be accomplished. And he didn't violate the will of Cyrus in doing it. Now, these are just a a couple. We don't have time to go into all of them, but just a couple of the many, many, many statements, many examples that are found in Scripture where we see God moving in the heart of an unbeliever to bring about his will. And in the same way, David is convinced that God will move in the hearts of these wicked men who want to kill him and that he'll thwart their plans. Although these men are ruthless, stubborn, evil men, they are liars, murderers, ungodly scoundrels who were determined to kill the Lord's anointed king of Israel. David is convinced that God is sovereign over all of their actions. And therefore, he's trusting the Lord to deliver him because he knows that his times are in God's hands. That's why he goes on specifically to ask the Lord to intervene and to to deliver him from these evil men. Verses 16 through 18. Make your face to shine upon your servant. Save me in your loving kindness. Let me not be put to shame, O Lord, for I call upon you. Let the wicked be put to shame. Let them be silent and shield. Let let the lying lips be mute, which speak arrogantly against the righteous with pride and contempt. Now, essentially, what David is asking is that the Lord would show him favor, shining upon him, smile upon him, and that he would show him this favor by saving him from the evil intentions of these men who want to disgrace him and everything godly that David stands for by killing him. Instead, he asked the Lord to disgrace them by silencing them and by taking their lives. Everything they wanted to do to him, he asked the Lord to do to them. Now, I doubt that most of us will ever find ourselves in a situation where we need to pray that God will take someone's life so that ours will be spared. But we do need to see from this, what we need to see is that we can trust God to deliver us from any trial we face because he is sovereign over all of the events of life, even those events, watch this, that involve other people making decisions that affect us. You have to apply the sovereignty of God to that or you really don't understand the sovereignty of God. Let me show you how practical all of this is, how relevant this truth is for every one of us. Jerry Bridges, in his magnificent book, Trusting God Even When Life Hurts, makes the observation that in the book of Exodus, second book in the Bible, God made the Egyptians who had previously hated the Jewish people, in fact, they had enslaved them, he made them favorably disposed towards Israel so that as Israel, the Jewish people, were all about to leave Egypt, you know what the Egyptians did? They had a complete change of mind. They gave them their gold and silver and clothing. Now, how does that work? The Bible says that the Jewish people plundered them. They didn't attack them. They gave it to them. They were favorably disposed to them as they were about to leave Egypt. The Egyptians had a complete change of mind. They gave them all this. So who changed their mind? God did. Here's what Jerry Bridges has to say about this and how this truth affects us. He writes, it's a little lengthy, but listen closely. This is life-changing. How did God do this? We don't know. 
We only know what the text tells us. It's obvious the Egyptians acted freely and voluntarily of their own wills. Yet they acted that way because, as the text says, the Lord has made them favorably disposed towards the Israelites. God, in some mysterious way, moved in their hearts so that they, of their own free choice, did exactly what he planned for them to do. God sovereignly intervened in the hearts, the desires, and the wills of the Egyptians to accomplish his purpose for the Israelites. All of us, at times, find ourselves in our futures seemingly in the hands of other people. Their decisions or their actions determine whether we get a good grade or a poor one, whether we're promoted or fired, whether our careers blossom or fold. He writes, I'm not overlooking our own responsibility in these, responsibility in these situations, but all of us know that even when we have, so to speak, done our best, we are still dependent upon the favor or frown of that teacher or boss or commanding officer. We are, from a human point of view, often at the mercy of other, others and people who make decisions or actions. Sometimes those decisions or actions are benevolent and good. Sometimes they're wicked or careless. Either way, they do affect us, often in a significant way. How are we to respond when we find ourselves seemingly in the hands of someone else when we desperately need a favorable decision or a favorable action on that person's part? Can we trust God that he can and will work in the heart of that individual to bring about his plan for us? End of quote. Well, the answer is yes. Yes, we can trust God to work in the heart of that individual. Why? Because David tells us that all of the events of our lives, including those decisions that come from other, people's, other people, are in God's hands. Folks, that's the point. Listen, you can trust the Lord in any time of trouble. That's the message of Psalm 31. Why? Because he's faithful. He'll keep his word Know his word so that you'll know what he's promised. Trust him because he's delivered you in the past. That's a lesson for you to remember. He hasn't forsaken you. He'll deliver you in the present. And trust him because he's sovereign. He controls everything. So no matter how hard things are, are going for you right now, you can trust him. These are the reasons. Now, if you're not a believer in Christ, this is somewhat irrelevant for you because you have to begin at the beginning. You have to trust him for salvation. That's where the Christian life begins. You have to see yourself as a rotten sinner, wretched sinner who deserves hell because God, as, as we heard, we were at a wedding yesterday and we heard Paul Washer say, God is good and we are not, and that's the problem. That is the problem. We need to repent of our sin. Our sin of what? Any sin that you're aware of, but basically it's the sin of being self centered, self-absorbed, living life for yourself, being rebellious towards Christ. And you cast yourself upon the mercy of Jesus Christ to save you because he died for sinners. And you trust that his death was on your behalf. If you do that, God will forgive your sin. He will put his righteousness on your account and make you fit to be in heaven when you die, and he'll start a relationship with you right now. That's where it begins. Trust him today. You may not have tomorrow. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this marvelous psalm, these truths here that, that David wanted us to know, and now we, we do know them, Lord. Thank you for his example. Thank you that this man trusted you and has told us that we can trust you too. Lord, I pray for everyone here that they'll believe your word that they'll know that you are the God of truth and take seriously your promises, regardless of how they feel, regardless of how things look. I pray also, Lord, that you'll bring to mind, each of us, how you delivered us in the past. Remind us of terrible times that we thought we could never get out of, didn't know how we would survive, and yet here we are because you've been so good to us. Remind us, Lord, no matter how difficult it gets, you who worked in the past can work and will work in the present and future. And Lord, help us to remember your sovereignty, that nothing happens to us by chance. It's no such thing as luck. You are sovereign, but you're also wise and you're also good. And nothing happens in our lives that, that hasn't been sent by your loving hand. So we pray that these things will encourage us 
and that they'll lead us to trust you more and more. And for those, Lord, who have never turned to Christ for salvation, we ask you to work in their hearts, only you opening their minds and hearts to the gospel will bring them to faith. So we pray to that end so that you would be glorified. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And we thank you for coming, and you're dismissed.